Download Upside and start getting cash back wherever you roll. It's like having your own hype man. Get an average of 17% cash back at restaurants. Oh, it's dinner time. Average of 13% on groceries. Get those groceries. 10 cents per gallon average cash back on gas. It's go time. Plus, cash back at participating convenience stores too. Stacks on stacks. Users can earn hundreds of dollars a year, three times more than other apps. Upside, show me that money. All right, we get it. Get it. It's easy. Just sign up for the free Upside app and start getting cash back for doing you. Download the free Upside app and use promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 on the free Upside app. Get cash back for doing you with the free app from Upside. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hello everybody and welcome to the Super J Cast. I'm Joel, joined by David McDonald. It is Saturday, 28th of January, 2023. This is episode 244. Um, I've got a question here from one of our listeners, Damon, which I'll read it to you. No username says, who do you reckon has the biggest hog in NJPW? And mm. I'm insulted. Is this all that people think of us, that we're just here to talk about porn and willies and wanking and that? Is that what they think of us? Well, I mean... <laughs> They do have a lot of... If the shoe fits. <laughs> right. You know, not for nothing. Uh, uh, we, do, uh, we do slide into that territory a little bit. Uh, is that a legitimate question, though? D- does anybody really care who has the biggest dick? We've d- done this before. It's Titan, isn't it? I'm, I thought so. I remember so. admiring his... Yeah. <laughs> throughout the whole of Best of Super Juniors. Uh, was it 2019 or 2018? Or maybe it was both. Hmm. I, I, maybe that's why he got signed to LIJ. <laughs> Almost certainly is. Maybe I'll put that on Twitter and pass that off as fact. There you go. Maybe I can officially confirm that. Yes. Right. Yeah. Got it. D- Dick, massive. Yep. Foot All right. Off. So we can <laughs> tick off the, uh, the the Dick conversation for this <laughs> this week's podcast. Really? Anyway, we've got a special episode this week because uh, speaking of dicks, we're no. no oh that's my really goodness! You're on fire today. You are. You <laughs> are, just popped in my head. I don't mean it. You are <laughs> just flamethrowers. Oh my lord! Today, ah, uh, go ahead, please. No, I'm not going to finish that sentence. No, finish it. Finish it. No, and uh, uh, the, the 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 dick and penis segment of the podcast is finished. Completely unrelated. Special treat this week is uh, an. NJPW Tamashi conversation, uh, about 45 minutes with our friends over at the Okada Shorts podcast, Rafe and Curtis, who took time out of their busy schedules to talk to us about everything down under going on for New Japan. So you got that to look forward to and I had a great time talking to them, Damon. Yeah, they're good dudes. They're good dudes. Um, and again, the, 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 the thing that blows my mind is that they didn't know each other um before they got together on the spot you know they just decided to do it uh is when we sent out the bat signal when joel was having his second child uh and they smashed it they did great and you know it it blossomed into a friendship from what they were talking about so really i I think this is a fun interview in the sense that not only do you really get a, a a good perspective of uh the scene down down there in australia all my friends in australia hello um the you kind of got you know how they connected through pro wrestling and through this silly show um i don't know at, at that i don't know why well it made me feel good like i was just like holy shit that's that's i mean if if we did anything joel if we've done anything uh, not only is this the number one podcast in not only just New Japan Pro Wrestling, but all of podcasting, I think. I think we've we've earned that uh, title. Uh, we have uh, made connections and uh, friendships have blossomed from this show. So uh, I will uh, die knowing that uh, I've done good in the world and you as well. 
Yes, yeah, stronger connections than my fucking internet connections. I'll tell you that for free. Uh, but fingers crossed it will uh, hold up today, despite the uh, sticky fluids that have been spilled on my MacBook. Come. Which, uh, you, you <laughs> well, <laughs> listeners, you'll have to wait and, and hear towards the end of the show to find out what I'm talking about there. But, uh, yeah, speaking of things to warm your heart, fantastic news statement. It seems like the Japan ban on cheering is now over. So... It's going to be official move of COVID to type five. So it's going to be the same as common flu on May the 8th. But from basically now onwards, people are allowed to cheer. Uh, you do need a mask to cheer, but there aren't any other rules for government buildings. Of course, private buildings can have their own rules. Like, you know, there are some buildings apparently where you've got to take your shoes off. Uh, so they could technically keep the cheering ban. But now there's this government announcement. There doesn't seem to be any reason to impose a, a cheering ban. We've got both uh, New Beginning and Sapporo shows and now cheering shows. So from where I'm standing, it looks like the battle is over. We have won. We've won. We've won. Yes. Everyone take a bow. Pat yourselves on the back. We've done it. We did it. Unbelievable. It's it finally, finally, finally. You know what? If you, it, And people are talking about going over and uh, spending some of their hard-earned cash once again uh, in Japan. And I couldn't be happier. It's fantastic news. Um, just put a mask in your fucking pocket. And I mean, here's the thing, too. Not for nothing. Uh, even during, and I'll put it in air quotes, normal times, there were masks everywhere. Every, you know, people were wearing masks if they were, you know, a little under the weather, had the sniffles. Uh, so it, it's not that odd to see. You'll be honest, it's not. Um, I all that I ask is just follow the rules. You may not agree. You may not think it. It's uh, it's not you know whatever. Just you know, just, just follow the rules if you're going over. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all I ask. Uh, and have fun. Enjoy because, uh, boy, we've earned it, haven't we, Joel? <laughs> we sure have. Yeah, I mean, it's really. It feels like the end of an era. So we've got the last clap crowds. Hopefully, uh, we've got the last strong tapings. So it just feels like all change onwards and upwards for 2023. So, I mean. Now we've got this line in the sand here. We've got a few questions about this. George says, now the clap crowd era is officially done. Who were MVPs and elevate themselves? Who suffered the most from the lack of crowd noise? And what are some forgotten matches that would have gotten some good buzz but didn't because they were handicapped by the restrictions? And Adam says, if you could choose one match or moment from the clap crowd era to have a cheering crowd, what would it be? Um, so working backwards from that, I mean, there have been a lot of great moments that I think have sort of transcended the clap crowd thing, like the Jonah Okada not even the match so much as just that moment where he went for the torpedo from the top rope of the mm. crowd, just that noise they made. And I think the fact that it was a clap crowd kind of enhanced that in a weird way. Just the fact that they broke it and actually made mouth noises made that a bit more special. But the one that sticks in my mind that I think ugh, just, if only that was a cheering crowd was that Coracon Hall main event between Robbie Eagles and El Fantasma mm. last year. Cause yeah. that was just a, Brilliant, brilliant match and so emotional. And if that had been a cheering crowd, they would have blown the roof off of it. And that would have been, I think, very high in conversations for a match of the year. And I think it would have further launched both their careers. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. The, just the timing of that. You put that match in a, in a hot cork and crowd. And yeah. Yeah. That could have been really. I mean, it was already a great match, but that could have been really something special. But yeah. Um, who who shined? Uh, I would say El Desperado. He's one guy that made the most of his of, of his time during the clap crowds. I think um, Jonah. I think you'd have to put on that list, right? Um, who else made the most of their time for clap crowds? Um, I think those two were probably be top of my list maybe even el fantasmo too um who didn't do well i think jay white and yeah, and i was gonna uh, say jay as well yeah and and unfortunately with jay it's a lot of that a lot of his stuff does rely on crowd reaction and crowd noise and 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 kind of pulling the strings if you will in in the, the way that he works his matches um, so I would say he's probably top of my list. Um, and then second, hmm. second, 
How about, oh, by the way, also, how about Will Ospreay on that list of people who did the most out yes. of Clap Crowd? Yeah. Um, yeah. Least, maybe. Mm, I don't know. Maybe the whole KOP thing was oh, horrific. Yano, I think Yano shtick really. Yep. Like falling on deaf ears, like it just killed it dead for me. Yep. And that, and, uh, and, and again, House of Torture. Was evil, yeah. Evil's heel turn. I think that was, you know, had that been the hill, I will always die on is that had that happened in a cheering crowd, I think it would have got over huge. That whole feud with Naito, yeah, yeah, that was weird. And, and, and you know, in hindsight, looking back, it's like, you know, here, here's here's a stable that is now just built for crowd reaction, you know, and you're gonna make them the center point. <laughs> didn't make much sense that did, did, did it um so yeah i mean but look i, I can't believe the company pushed on <laughs> it's just like like seriously in, in five years when you look back on that time you're going to shake your head and be like what in the how did we get through this like <laughs> just unbelievable but finally we're here it feels good it feels good little baby steps along the way but um, getting that news is, is fantastic news. Yes. Uh, Bash says, how difficult is to cheer through a mask? I'm sure they still have to wear masks, right? Uh, yes, they do. I don't think I could sit through a show wearing a mask for that long and cheer too. Um, do you ever try to cheer wearing a mask? I'm trying to think. No, I don't believe so. Uh, I mean, you know, you kind of breathe in your own air and you get warm. In the winter, it's nice because you keep yourself nice and toasty warm. Uh, I mean, look, it could be done. I mean, they, once again, like every time somebody even has the slightest sniffle, they, they're, 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 the uh, masks are being put on. So, I mean, they, I don't know the way, but they know the way. Uh, and as long as they know the way, then I'm fine. Knock yourselves out. Uh, other bit of news we had this week was the announcement of March the 1st. We've got the first ever All-Star Junior Festival in Korakuen Hall. So junior heavyweights from all across the wrestling landscape will compete live on NJPW World Pay-Per-View. And some of the company, well, I'll read them all. 2AW, 666 Pro Wrestling, All Japan Pro Wrestling, Big Japan Pro Wrestling, CMLL, DDT, Tradition, Dragon Gate, Gambare, Glate, Just Step Out, Kyushu Pro Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Osaka Pro Wrestling, Pancrase Mission, Basara, Freedoms, Noah, Secret Base, Zero One, Ryukyu, Dragon Pro Wrestling. So I'm tremendously excited by this. And, um, of course, it, a little bit surprised that there's no AEW involvement, but whilst I'm surprised about that, I'm not disappointed at all because I'm just excited to see what this show looks like and see the representatives from all these companies. And I'm sure it's going to be a lot of multi-man tag matches, but it would be so cool if they could use this as a launching point for a proper Super J Cup where, you know, you got one entrant from each of these promotions and just bring it back to like that sort of early 90s feel where, you know, I had that single elimination knockout thing and that would just be so much fun. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this event. Yeah. I'm, I was hoping that it would have been what you described with like a, a, a tournament having that vibe um but from what i understand it's just a show correct it's just going to be a show with all these representatives yes. and that's not yeah, a, that's right i mean it like again if i if i had a preference i would love a tournament but even with that said i think they have a wide range of wrestlers that they can make this really creative and really fun and really interesting and if you know over over top of that, we could see some pretty fucking awesome matches. Um, it is great that there is that, you know, everybody's, if, if it feels to me, it's everyone kind of pulling in the same direction, right? And what's the saying, you know, uh, a, you know, a, what the tides raise all ships or whatever the fuck it is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, rising tide lifts all ships, something like something that. Something like that, right? But yeah, no, I agree with you. It seems like there's a sort of understanding amongst all these um, pro wrestling companies in Japan that they've got to work together to inject, you know, spark some life back into the scene because it definitely, it, you know, I, I shared that article earlier in the week from uh, pwanalysis.com about uh, pro wrestling ticket sales in Japan. So attendance last year was about 70% of pre-pandemic levels. 
Uh, there's a bit about New Japan losing their market share, but attendance is increasing. Uh, so, I mean, it's looking good for the uh, Bushi Road company. So, New Japan, Stardom, Stardom's more than doubled since the pandemic started, but other companies in not such good shape. And I think there's just an understanding that if you put aside the, uh, you know, the political disputes, then if these guys can work together, then they can really, you know, get things back on track. Yeah. And that's all they really need to do is just get their footing back. Um, that's not to say that all, you know, this is how it's going to be forever, but at least in the short term, I think it's beneficial for, for all these promotions to be, if they want to survive to kind of in, in some general way, work together and, and these big shows, uh, on top of that, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic idea. And I think a lot of those smaller promotions, your six, six, sixes and your freedoms and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of those guys work all around all those other promotions, but to have a, dare I say, a juggernaut of Japanese pro wrestling kind of spearhead this, um, again, more eyeballs on a product and hopefully they can collect more fans um, and again, kind of right the ship. One name that I didn't hear, and maybe I missed it. uh, Did I hear any all Japan representation? Uh, that is a great question. Let me go back and check the Sorry. list. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, all Japan are there. Okay, great. Okay, good. Because I know they're, you know, they're, they're one company that could probably use it too. So I'm excited for it. Um, I again, we don't know what it looks like, uh, what matches, what's how is it going to to kind of pan out. But um, anything like this, it's kind of. I, I dig. I dig the idea of so uh, good for them, and I'm glad that they were able to work together on this. Uh, other thing I would like to talk about are some awards in the Japanese magazine. So first of all, the Shoe Pro Awards, which is a bit like PWI. So basically, it's a weekly sports magazine you can buy in convenience stores. It's mostly in cafe, but it's very Bushi Road heavy. But I'll just read out some of the awards here and the placement of the New Japan wrestlers and factions so best foreigner number one will osprey number two zach number three jay white number five was jonah number seven alex zane number eight tamatonga best unit number two was united empire number four lij number six bullet club number eight suzuki gun number nine house of torture and i thought it was actually quite funny that house of torture appeared in their head of chaos but there you go uh, best match first place was the okada osprey g1 final second place was uh, despi versus jun kasai third place tanahashi kenta seventh place osprey and naito eighth place okada shingo ninth place lij versus congo favorite wrestler number one tanahashi number two naito number three okada number six despi number 19 hiromu number 20 jay white and another set of awards from net pro wrestling which is a more sort of hardcore smart audience there so for their mvp first was okada two osprey four kojima fifth despi 11th great okan and match of the year one was the first place match was Despi versus Jun Kazai, second Osprey versus Okada, ninth Osprey versus Zach, tenth Osprey versus Orange Cassidy. So the two things standing out for me there are one United Empire and Will Osprey, very very popular amongst the Japanese fans, and two El Desperado, yes. ranking really highly, not only match of the year but people's favorite wrestler. And you know you mentioned it before about a guy who has taken the ball and run with it in this you know, this, this pandemic era. Now that's behind us. It really looks like we've, I don't want to say lucked into, but, you know, two uh, silver linings from this thing is firstly United Empire, secondly El Desperado. Yeah, a thousand percent. Um, I'm thrilled that that match has gotten the recognition that it rightfully deserves. What a fucking great match. Um and Made the top ten, I think, of the uh, voices of wrestling match of the year poll as well. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Like, uh, uh, you know that that's a match that you know, quite honestly, could very easily fall under the radar. Um, but the fact that, not for nothing, the fact that sites like you know ours, voices of wrestling. Uh, you know, even like keeping it strong style and uh, Okada shorts. And, you know, there is like there is something to be said about the platforms that we have, because I remember raving about that match and everywhere I listened, people raved about that match. But even with that said, you kind of had to go out of your way to watch it. It wasn't like it was, you know, 
front and center, like an AEW show or something like that. Um, so I'm very happy that 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 people went out of their way to not only find it, watch it, uh, but they enjoyed it too. And yeah, Despy. I mean, look at what he did in in, in our year ends. Um, I, I, he. I don't know. They have they have an absolute stud um, that they can go to really at any time um, in their back pocket. It's fantastic, and and he made it work for himself, and he deserves all the credit for that. So, um, yeah, great job. All right. Well, uh, we have had a couple of shows during the week. We've had Road to the New Beginning um, from Korako and Hall. Now. I'm not going to go match by match. I'm not even going to talk about all the matches. Just some of the standout things from the shows. Uh, how much of these these have you seen, Damon? Uh, a limited. I saw like main events and um, things that you recommended. But yeah. All right. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Ryohei Oiwa versus Great Okan. This is from January 24th. So I just always enjoy watching Great Okan against the Young Lions because it's got a really fun element of. I'm kind of like playing with his food and he just really helps build the heat for the young lines where a lot of other like main roster wrestlers, when they're up against the young line, it feels like they're sort of going through the motions. And I, I know we say this a lot about a lot of young lines and lots of variables. So there's no such thing as a, a slam dunk future star when you're looking at these young lines, but Oiwa, he's got the technique, he's got the muscularity, he's got the hunky good looks to be a star. So very, very excited about him. I think he's got tons of upside there. And hat tip to Great Khan having a finisher called Pancake Cold. Have you seen the new T-shirt he's got out there? No, I haven't. No. All right, I'm going to send you a please, link to this. Please, right, Because it, it, it is tremendous because he's really capitalizing on the pancake gimmick there. And I just love the way that O'Conn leans into this stuff and adds to his lore with right. little things like the pancakes and the horny weekend in Vegas in a way that not a lot of wrestlers do. Like some wrestlers and their gimmicks are very static. They're very stale. I'm just, you know, picking a random example. Could you tell me in any way how Sanada's character and moveset has evolved since, I don't know, 2020? Right. And, you know, that might play into a storyline, but we'll touch on that later. So, Great Okan's a guy that, you know, I think perverts like us enjoy because we follow the character and not just the wrestler, all his horny adventures and enjoy how they help him evolve as a wrestler. So, um, in conclusion, Oiwa, good. Great Okan, good. No one else has given you this level of analysis for a six-minute young life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm looking at the pancakes. Okay. Uh, I mean, I was expecting more pancake material. Uh, it is I a- want a T-shirt of him riding that the massive mechanical yes. penis. Yes. I would buy that. I would buy I don't know if I would wear it, but I would buy it just because he did it. Um, that would be great. I mean, that's a that's a fine shirt, but like I wouldn't know that was pancake related. Um, it's literally what yeah. Apparently, it? the translation is, "Do you want pancakes?" Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fine. I, I I honestly I I was expecting a little bit more. Um, terrible job by the merchandising department. Terrible job. I did. <laughs> no, they stick. Bunch of fucking clowns what over a, there. What a, what a dropped ball. That's what they are. They're a bunch of dropped balls over there. Um, <laughs> what? What's a dropped ball? Uh, hey. No, uh, Okan is uh, – he's a treasure. We should uh, – the way he the, he does lean into that. And I love the fact that you said this term to describe his matches with Young Lions, playing with his food. Because that's what it is. That's exactly what it is. Um, so I will be using that in, in uh, all, all future – jcast episodes great uh one of the other highlights i think of these shows were the matches between chaos and tmdk so tmdk they got their new aesthetic here we've got the new orange trim gear for zach there's a new punk music theme for a lot of them and it just really fits the aesthetic of them but they kind of feel like a, a bunch of naughty secondary school lads who you'd see hanging around the bus stop smoking and you you cross the road to avoid them. Mm. And I don't know, there's something about them that kind of reminds me of, uh, you're familiar with the 80s UK comedy TV show, The Young Ones. Oh, yes. Is there something about them? Is this just me that I kind of, sort of, kind of get sort of similar counterculture, don't give a shit vibes from them? I don't know. It could just be me. But I just think it's really smart the way they've added Fujita to the mix because it's, it's a bit like, 
you know, when a gang adopts someone's little brother and they start corrupting them for fun. Right. Because you can see TMDK teaching slash corrupting Fujita, whether that's teaching him swear words backstage or teaching him moves in the match itself. Like we had Zach doing the side by side arm lock demonstration to help Fujita submit Nakashima. That was so creative. Like Zach's there showing him how to step over the head mm-hmm. to get more leverage. And like, not only does that help build the Zach Ishii match, because Zach's doing an Ishii in the ring alongside, but I just love the attention to detail to have this little self-contained story of Fujita getting this education in a random mid-card eight-man road to tag match. Like, you never feel you're wasting your time with these shows. There's always something to seek your teeth into. And it's just really cool to see Fujita's moveset expand show by show and, and having a story behind each new move. And it's like what I talked about with Okan. You know, seeing him get the edge on his classmates, Oiwa and, and Nakashima, and we're sowing the seeds of long-term generational rivalries. So, yeah, really good stuff there. And, and also genuinely excited to see Badu Tito reunite with the gang because just them adding Fujita has just made it so much more fun to watch. No doubt. No doubt. And, the, you know, I don't know how long it was, you know, between the actual implementation and the thought of Zach having his own faction, you know, kind of being the de facto leader. Um, but what, I mean, can, can you think of a, a more creative guy that, that again, he's, that's his, these are his boys and this is his faction. And, and like, you know, you're going to get creativity and you know, you're going to get create, not only creativity, but creativity in a realistic fashion. Um, like again, the idea of of um a young lion being brought in and 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 literally in front of your eyes, seeing you know the training and the and and the ball busting and the hazing and the you know it's kind it, I dig it and yeah, now you mentioned that I didn't before, but I could see the young one stuff. Yeah, I could abs- absolutely see it. Um, look, it's amazing how. The, these British wrestlers, if you give them the reins, <laughs> it's 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 fun to see. Completely different uh, empire and uh, and and Zach's faction. It's different, but yet very similar and very creative and very fun and very fresh. Um, I mean, they're doing it right. Look. Th- the to me, my two favorite factions as it is right now, and you know I'm not the huge faction guy, but if, like are those two, and I just think they they do it so incredibly well. So yeah, good times. And the other thing was, of course, in the main event on January 24th, we had a six man tag match between Shota Umino, Yano, and Okada against Sanada, Shingo, and Naito, which ended with Shota Umino pinning Sanada following the Death Rider. Mm. So that I thought was really interesting because something's up with Sanada. Yeah. He's eaten a lot of losses. Thank he lost to Manabu Sawyer at the Yokohama show. And there's been a lot of talk from him backstage about how he needs to you know, break everything down, start from square one. Uh, Okamoto from Tokyo Sports said that he might leave New Japan. Uh, Andrew from the Discord tells me that the wording in Japanese he's using is very similar to the tagline on Ren Narita's merchandise in English, uh, something along the lines of no creation without destruction. So I don't know. It looks like something is up here. And I don't know, you know, it's, uh, I was talking about this with Manabu. Manabu seems to think that Sonata might end up with just four guys because, you know, he's got that chemistry with Tai Chi. They seem to like each other. So that would be, you know, something that you might raise your eyebrow at and think, oh, that's a weird fit. But yeah, I mean, he is scheduled to be teaming with LIJ for the rest of this tour, but long term, I don't know, something strange is going on, isn't it? Yeah. We should get Chris Samso on the line. So you see him the last time he was won a singles match, Sonata. Um it does feel like he's eaten a lot of pins. And you know, he's not the type of person in the in the New Japan pecking order that would be sub- subject to that many pinfalls. And again, it doesn't seem like it's a lot, but he's the guy that's taken them. Um, he does need a new coat of paint. I mean, I think we all can agree on that. Um, he is, without question, one of the more, let's call it 
subtle <laughs> pro wrestlers. Um, it's something. Something needs to be done because, and I think it is. And I think I think the handwriting is on the wall. Again, there there's a reason why he's looking at the light so often. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he if he if he goes to what what do they call three men and, and a baby? What are they call? <laughs> <laughs> just four guys. Just and four then guys. Maybe just five guys. All right. I love five guys. Delicious hamburgers. Uh, very expensive though. Um, peanuts and P.S. Eating the peanuts. Yes. Um, mm, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know if that's the answer though. To be quite frank, but. Something needs to be done, and I again, not to beat a dead horse, but I think it, I think that you could see it right in front of you. And of course, a big milestone there for Shota Umino getting his first Korokuin main event win there mm-hmm. and getting to do his post match speech. So, you know, not for nothing, I think they're all in on this guy. So, I'm expecting big things from him this year. Uh, just the other little thing, actually, you know, I'll save that for when we're, we're doing the previews for uh, the Sapporo shows. So, uh, anything else stood out for you from the Road 2 shows? They were fine. I mean, Look, they're row two shows. I spend. I've learned the trick, the 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 Joel watching trick of uh, double speed <laughs> to kind of get through some of the stuff. But um, I mean, they were fine shows. I don't think. Um, I don't think everything like there was no there was nothing massive great matches, right? Um, I mean, they, they were fine. They were they were above average row two shows. How about that? All right, let's uh, then bring us on to our preview for the new beginning in Sapporo. So that's Saturday, February 4th in the Hokkaido Prefectural Sports Centre. Full cheering crowds. Yes. Hallelujah. Uh, we're opening up with Oscar Leiber versus Great Okan. I mean, I'm just going to quickly go through these. I don't think there's a need for us to preview all of these in detail until we get to the big ones. Second match, we've got Oiwa, Narita, Despi and Suzuki against Dick Togo, Sho, Yujiro and Evil. It's interesting having Oiwa teamed up with this sort of alliance of Narita, Despi, and Suzuki, who, of course, are they want their crack at the Never Six Man title. So maybe Oiwa's just there to take the pin, but who knows? I mean, Fujita has been assigned a faction. Maybe Oiwa will be next. Maybe. So we want to keep an eye on there. Uh, third match is Yuta Nakashima, Yoshihashi, Ishii, and Goto against the TMDK team of Fujita, Shane Hayes, Mikey Nichols, Zack Sabre Jr. I expect we'll see more of the same as we saw. Uh, from Korakun Hall. Fourth match, we've got Master Wato, Hikuleo Tamatonga, and Hiroshi Tanahashi against Taiji Shimori, El Phantasmo, Kenta, and Jay White. Fifth match, we've got Yo, Taguchi, Yano, Okada against Bushi, Hiromu, Sanada, and Shingo. It'll be interesting to see is Sanada going to eat another pin there? If he does, I mean, that's definitely a big red flag there. So something to keep an eye on. Now, the meat and potatoes of this show. Sixth match, we have the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championship. The champions, Francesco Akira and TJP, catch 2-2 against the challengers, Doki and Yoshinobu Kanemaru. That should be good, right? That should be really fucking good. Um, and, and don't... Oh, by the way. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, David. Nope. Did you see the finish of their, the United Empire versus Just Four guys from the new beginning in Nagoya show? No. Where Osprey just came out of nowhere with the flying... Hidden Blade. It was amazing. If, if anyone hasn't seen it, go back and just watch, even just watch the last five minutes of the match because the, the finish was absolutely spectacular. But yeah, I apologize for interrupting. Back to you. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, like I was saying, the, the the he has partners on the other side of that ring that can really go. Um, and even Katamaro is a guy who we all praise for kind of like being a, a, a foundation, if you will, for a good match. So yeah, I mean, on paper, this looks really sweet. Really sweet. Yeah, the caveat going into this one is through these Row 2 shows, Kanemaru has been working over TJP's leg. So it's interesting that they felt the need to build in that little sort of chink in the armor for Catch 2 2 because, you know, maybe without it, they thought that uh, Doki and Kanemaru were not credible challengers. So, I mean, I see in one sense it would be good to establish the credibility of Just Four Guys to give them the junior titles going in, but I'm just, I'm enjoying this catch 2 2 reign so much that I, just, I think they're going to hold on to it. I hope they do. I hope they do. Um, Cause for me, for the junior titles, I mean, look, them plus whomever equals 
probably a really good match. <laughs> so you know, them being the common denominator. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I, th- I and I, and I think they do. I think they hold on to it. Seventh match is a special singles match between Will Ospreay and Tai Chi. And yeah, this seems to be the spot for Tai Chi now that he is the sort of bounce back, the, the comeback singles feud for guys who lost at Wrestle Kingdom. So I don't think he's going to win this. I think this uh, year is going to be the Will Ospreay story about him building himself back up at the point where he can overcome Okada or Omega or both of them. So whilst uh, I'm really looking forward to this match and they haven't wrestled each other too many times, I think. I think they may have met in G1 climaxes uh, in the last couple of years, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be hard hitting. I think it's going to be really good, but I do see Osprey taking the W here. I think it's going to be outstanding. Yeah, I think. And again, this is one of those matches where people can hopefully sink their teeth into Tai Chi that haven't jumped on board because, um, yeah, once again, he's in there with a great dance partner. So it's it's going to be fun. Let me ask you this. Will Ospreay, G1 Climax winner? Yeah, I think so. I if you were so to too. ask me now, I think he'd be a, a solid bet. Yep, I do too. All right, we're on the same page there. And our main event is a special singles match with Shota Umino against Tetsuya Naito. So Shota made his big singles comeback at Historic Crossover where he lost to Will Ospreay. And he got his big win at Wrestle Kingdom in that six-man tag match. Now, this is an interesting one because I think you really should have Shota winning this one. As much as I love Naito, Naito doesn't need the win here. He's Teflon. He's got his... uh, KG Muto match to look forward to at Tokyo Dome. I'm not sure that the outcome of this really impacts the Muto match at all. Mm-hmm. So I think Umino gets the win. I think it's, you know, I think it's telling that the guys on top of the show, um, I did I did question the fact that, it, again, we, we're going into the that Doe match with Muto. Um you're right. He probably doesn't necessarily need to, but would you want to have that happen? Um, Does he get the win? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. I mean, he should, you would think that it's, it's ripe for the picking, but I don't think he gets the win. I think Knight took us to win. I just, here's the thing. Here's the problem I have. Like there is a lot of fucking, I don't want to say history, but like, like Naito's built up a case where you could argue that he has been the most important guy on that roster for you know a couple of years. Um, I just can't see it happening, just because because it's New Japan. Um, should it happen? Maybe, probably. It's positioned to be. I just can't. Yeah, I mean, like, if, wrap my head around. Why would they book? Why would they book um, Umino to have another singles feud that he's going to lose? Right, I agree. All right, I, I definitely agree with that. But in the same breath, I mean, in a main event, Naito losing to the guy, I don't know. I, I maybe, may, maybe it's me. Just can't, you know, I, I can't stop thinking of him being a young lion. Um, and maybe it's too quick and maybe it's what, but I mean, you are right. And again, it is the main event. And if, you know, if you're looking for a big win, that is it. I don't know. I just like my heart says yes, but my brain says, I don't know. I just can't see it. Just trying to look at previous patterns. So when Jay White returned from excursion, he lost his big, um, return match against Tanahashi mm. at Wrestle Kingdom, but then he beat Kenny Omega at New Beginning. Right. Great Khan lost to Okada, and then, if I'm not mistaken, he lost to Tanahashi at Wrestle Kingdom. So I guess that's the question. Is is he going to be following the Jay White trajectory where you know he loses the first big match, but then we're strapping the rocket pack to him? Or is it going to be Great Khan where he's going to slide into the mid-card? And I don't know the answer to that. I... I I think it's going to be the former. And again, I do think Shota's going to get the win here. But I mean, even the result aside, I think a lot of people still have question marks about Shota Umino 
in ring you know can he cut it at the very top level and that question may be answered for a lot of people in this Naito match do you have any concerns about Shota about him actually being able to wrestle like a, a top tier New Japan guy I, I don't but but this is the test right this is this is it right and I think that people can plant a flag in this match and say okay you know this is a an, an, an important this this has the possibility and for me the intrigue in this match is is this a marker for this guy's career? Like, are we going to look back in three years and be like, okay, this was the match that that set it off, right? Um, this was the be- the real beginning of him getting that rocket. Um, so to me, that's the intrigue. And I think people that are going to be watching that should be mindful of that. Um, I think this, this finish is going to be be rather important in the, in the future of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Let's put it that way. And that takes us on to night two. So that's Sunday, February 5th in Hokkaido. We're opening up with Akira, TJP, Great Khan, and Will Ospreay against Taka, Doki, Kanemaru, and Taichi. Second match, we got Nakashima, Narita, Despi, and Suzuki against Dick Togo, Sho, Yujiro, and Evil. Third match, Wato and Tanahashi against Ishimori and Kenta. Fourth match, Jado, Hikuleo, Tamatonga against Ghetto, ELP, and Jay White. Fifth match, Taguchi, Shota Umino, Yano, Okada versus Bushi, Sanada, Shingo, and Naito. And our sixth match, we have the IWGP Tag Team Championship match. We have the champions, Bishamon, Yoshihashi, and Hiroki Goto, with their first defense against the challengers, TNDK, Shane Haste, and Mikey Nichols. Now, I do really love Bishamon. I thought they were fantastic in the World Tag League. I thought they were great in the final and even better during the Wrestle Kingdom match against FTR. But Mm. I kind of feel this is one and done for them. I don't think they're going to win here. I think if we're going to get over TMDK as a serious threat on this roster, then I think Shane and Mikey are going to bring home the gold to establish this faction as a serious threat. So we've got Zach with his TV title, We've got Shane and Mikey with their heavyweight tag titles. And I think TMDK are good value for it. I thought they were one of, if not maybe the best performers consistently during the World Tag League. People are sleeping on them. They're a, a high quality tag team. And I think they're going to prove it here. A lot of people are going to sit up and take notice. And I think they're going to win. I'm with you. I'm, 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 I'm a thousand percent with you. Well, I am on board on this. Um it does establish a, a, a new faction. It does uh, establish them as a credible threat. It does establish, uh, you know, everything. And and here's the thing too: it's it's not like Goto and and Yoshihashi couldn't take the loss. Like it's completely, f- you know, within the realm of, <laughs> you know, uh, it's not far fetched. Let's put it that way. Um, so. Yeah, I'm with you. I think there's a title change here. Yep. And and again, you know how I like to go up and down a card and be like, okay, how many title changes? Do we don't want too many? But I think I think there's where you're going to get yours. Um, so yeah, title change. Uh, seventh match is a 50 minute time limit NJPW World TV Championship match with Zack Sabre Jr. in his first defense against Tomohiro Ishii. Now this TV title was promoted as something for the younger wrestlers. So as much as I enjoy the work of Tomohiro Ishii, I think having, (laughs) yeah, exactly. I do think that having a 47 year old wrestler holding that title would, would not be a good look. So I just think this is a a filler defense for Zach. It's going to be a tremendous match. Like they, they always have good chemistry. I think back to, was it Wrestle Kingdom 13? They had a really good match for the Rev Pro title, but yeah, I think this is a pretty straightforward victory for Zach. And as I said, TMDK uh, dripping with gold. Yep, and and here's the thing too, I like the uh, step where the uh, there's that time limit. So you you are going to get not you know fast. Well, you're going to get fast paced, but it's not going to be rushed. Uh, you know, squeezing nine pounds of shit in an eight pound bag. Uh, it's it's you know it's everything is going to make sense, but everything is going to be efficient. Let's put it that way. Um, and that's to me, those are the best type of Ishii matches. So, um, yep, all in on this. 
Main event, eighth match, uh, 60 minute time limit, IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship match. Hiromu Takahashi defending against Yo. Now, I wish this one had a 15 minute time limit. I really <laughs> think this is the kind of match that it, I worry the fact that it's been put in as a main event. Because if they think, well, it's a main event, we've got to go 35 minutes here, I think that's really going to harm it. Now, let's not forget that these two had what was. I, I think a fucking great best of the super juniors final a couple of years ago. I really think it was outstanding. So I hope we get more of that. And there's that sense of urgency and not the sort of plodding uh, ponderous start to new Japan main events that a lot of people criticize. So I don't think yo is going to win again. I just feel this is a fill of defense. I do feel that the long-term interesting story that they have in the junior division involves Master Watto. So I expect him to be picking up some wins and build his way up to eventually getting his hands on this title. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's best of the super juniors, that the, the, the conduit by which he does it. But I don't see Yo winning the belt here. But I just, I really hope he channels some of that magic that went into that best of the super juniors final. I wouldn't necessarily have a huge issue if Yo won. Um, and I'll tell you why. He's a perfect example of a guy who could use a title to help elevate his game. You know, we talk about guys that don't need titles. You know, he's that guy. I think he needs a title. I wouldn't have a problem with it. And then, like, what would you rather see? Would you rather see Yo Master Watto or Yo or, uh, or uh, Hiromo Master Watto? Well, let me piggyback that answer off a, a question from Daryl says, as great as Hiromu has been, he's gone a bit stale for me. I love the guy, but I can't help thinking that he needs to go away for a bit or get a new gimmick. Is it just me or does he need the shake up? So viewed through that lens, I think Yo is a more interesting junior champion than Hiromu. So for the sake of freshness and just seeing something different, then I would be quite excited to see Yo win. I think so too. I think so, too. Um, and again, it, it, he is a guy that I feel like needs a title, and Hiromu doesn't necessarily. I don't know if Hiromu needs a new coat of paint, but he's falling into the Kushida trap of, what do, what, what do we do with this guy? He's, you know, he's he's kind of done everything he can as a junior, and he went away for a while. Um, and, you know, at the time we were when we were talking about it, it was a painful loss because I think everyone – uh, you know, I, I don't want to say everyone, but I think the, the majority of people enjoy his work. Um, but I don't know. I mean, like, what what else do you do with Hiromo? The problem is, is that he can't grow you know, three inches or four inches. Um, we still have we still have a junior division. So it is what it is. Um, but, yeah, it's it, w- it would be fresh up top. Um, and let's see what he does with the title. Um, I, to me, that's more exciting than Hiromu and Master Wato. I mean, I'm going to be truthful. Master Wato, as we all well know, does nothing for me. And Yo is right behind. So maybe two negatives equal a positive, right? Let's let's give it a shot. Why not? Give it fucking throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. Uh, Louis says the big show is called the new beginning. Will we see some shocking event happening at the big show or should we temper our expectations? Well, I'm going to stick a pin in that until we preview the Osaka show okay. next week. Cause I think that is where we might see some shocking angles. Is there anything from these two Sapporo cards we've discussed, Damon, that you think could be uh, a surprising or, or shocking turn of events? Maybe something with Sonata. Um, that's about it. Uh, I mean, when you talk about shocking, will there be title changes? I think so. Um, I don't know if necessarily shocking is the word I would use for these two shows, but uh, I mean, the, the, the possibility of a Sonata, something weird with Sonata is is on the table, I think. Um, and again, it's, again, not shocking. Maybe the finish of the, of the Naito match uh, might be something that people want to, again, stick a flag in and, you know, let, let's let's remember this five years from now as kind of like the launching point. Right. So that is our preview for the new beginning in Sapporo. Uh, Another thing I wanted to mention, I did touch on it last week, but Rocky Romero becoming the new top heel in CMLL was not something I saw coming, but it's fucking tremendous. Uh, Listeners do go out of your way to check out 
the match he had with Volador Jr. It is up there for free on YouTube, so no reason not to watch it. And it's just a timely reminder that we we get every six months or so where we forget how brilliant Rocky Romero is as a singles wrestler. And when you give him the tap on the shoulder and put him on a big stage, he delivers in spades. Um, So I'm sure you haven't seen this one yet, and probably most of our listeners haven't. So only sort of tangentially related to New Japan. But, you know, maybe this will play into Fantastic Mania in in a, a month's time. So who knows? But, yeah. Definitely worth watching that one if you haven't already. All right. Appreciate the heads up on that. I will tech, I will check it out. All right. Um, should we do a few questions before we go? Yeah, why not? All right. Uh, Jim Lorraine Bar says, are you excited for Asanayama's return to Makuchi? So sumo question for me. How are you feeling about Takakesho possibly making Yokozuna suit? So Takakesho, he's not making Yokozuna. I think he'd have to win the next tournament as well. I think maybe he had a bit of an injury in the current one. So he would, had he had a more impressive winning record, I think he could have got it. But what, what did he get? Twelve and three. That's not quite good enough because it's a pretty weak field at the moment. So I would expect Asanayama to come in and clean up really because it's looking really weak, particularly at the top. The Azekis are all shitting the bed. So yeah, I am excited for Asanayama's return, and I expect him to be um, getting a, a pretty good record in the next basho. So. Uh, yeah, there's my sumo talk. Uh, Mitch says, thoughts on the DJ Carl Frederick signing with WWE. Did you see this, David? Uh, I did not. Is that right? Um, yeah, it's with NXT. Okay. Well, good for him. I mean, listen, I think, look, the guy was unhappy at New Japan. We all know that. Um, but for whatever reason, it couldn't be sorted out. Um, I'm happy the guy's still in pro wrestling. He didn't give up pro wrestling, period. Um He's got he's got the look. He's got he's got he's got the talent. I mean, I think it's a missed opportunity for New Japan. And again, whatever the reasons, I, who knows? But uh, I'm 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 actually happy that he's still in pro wrestling. Uh, and I think he's going to be pretty successful. I, I still do. Yeah, I do wish him the best. I think it just it wasn't a good fit for him in New Japan. Um, you know, gun to my head, do I think he's going to become a huge star in NXT? I don't know. It's just so hard to tell in that company. But yeah, I don't have any ill feeling towards him. And yeah, I'll be, actually, I'll, I'll be rooting for him. I hope he does well in NXT. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Multiverse A says, after Wrestle Kingdom and Dash, what are you most looking forward to in 2023? Osprey Omega 2 at MSG, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Also, cheers on the live discussion during Wrestle Kingdom. It was a lovely time listening to all three of you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is. I think this year is going to be the year uh, of the. Of, of, you know, we talk about other people's redemptions, and I think this is Will Osprey's redemption. Uh, I'm looking for probably most on my New Japan calendar would be circling G1. Um, again, we're getting crowds, vocal crowds, which would be incredibly awesome. Uh, yeah, and maybe a little. Uh, Maybe a little return to the States. Uh, we were promised a Madison Square Garden show many years ago. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe we find a way to uh, take a look at some Forbidden Door 2 action, Electric Boogaloo. Anwar says, is this the best New Japan has felt since early 2020 to start a year? Yes. I mean, it really does feel like we're locked and loaded ready to be firing on all cylinders. Like all the ingredients are there for New Japan to have a, a killer 2023. Yep. I'm with you. I mean, listen, I haven't been more excited for the product in, in honestly a long time. It's, you know, it's, it feels like they're, they've set up things. I want to say perfectly, but like they have a plan, they have a game plan. Um, and some things are going to hit. And I think more things will hit than miss, but at least there's a game plan. Uh, and that's, I feel good about. So, um, and again, clear cheering crowds. It, 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 we say it a thousand times and you're probably sick of it, but it's, it's, it's vital. I think we, I think if anything we've all learned is that boy, pro wrestling needs fan partic- Like there are, there are, there are, you know, can be multiple people in the ring, but like the people that are sitting in the chairs are, 
I don't want to say equally as important, but they play a factor in your joy- enjoyment of pro wrestling, no doubt. So it's uh, we're we're ready to rock and roll. Will Rocky ever get the chance to book the main company and not just Strong, or does not being a native from the company block that opportunity? I mean, it's an interesting question, especially with Strong not following the taping format anymore and seemingly just being big shows pepper throughout the year. So now it's a sort of different kind of booking. So you don't have to have that sort of week to week continuity and those sort of long term storylines. So it's, yeah, it's going to be a different challenge for Rocky. But as to whether or not he can book the actual main product, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much input he has Already. as it is. I think yeah. he'd be a, a really good voice in the room. You know, for at least for the junior division, the junior tag division, you know, maybe he already is a voice in that room. Who knows? I'm sure he is. Uh, I'm I'm sure he is. Um, I you know w- when that question was asked, I did think back to okay. I'm trying to think. Um, I remember Steve Carino when he was in Wrestle One was doing maybe not booking. Or maybe he was. I'm not sure. Uh, but I know he had a lot to do with uh, foreign talent going over there. Um, and I knew he was a voice in 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 decisions. I don't know if he fully had the book. Um, yeah, I might be. Uh, but here's the thing. He has he has so much time uh, back, you know, kind of being a voice backstage. That I'm sure that. Look, let's put it this way. If, if there's anyone that would have a chance of being that guy, it's him, right? Um, will that ever happen him fully 100%? I don't think so. But um, him having a big say, like to me, he's, you know, the mo- modern day Tiger Hattori um, in that sense. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't think he'll fully get the book, but. If, if anyone has a, a, a remote chance, it's him. Daryl says, I'm genuinely excited about 2023. All the shakeups and promotions of Young Lions, another new talent. So I have a difficult double-edged question. Who do you hope steps it up to greater prominence in 2023? And who do you hope steps away? Uh, I'm going to add another question to that. Arya Man says, if you became New Japan's booker from right this moment, which wrestlers will you build the 2023 around and what changes would you like to see in the hierarchy of wrestlers? Um, so... Yeah, who would you like to see elevated, and who would you like to see de, de-, de- elevated, relegated, relegated, escalated, toned down? Uh, well, I said it before that I think Jay White is one guy that could use a change of pace, and I think the company can use a change of pace from him. Um, and I think it would be a positive for both. Um, who would I like to see? Well, I mean, we're, I think we're already seeing uh, the idea of stepping up, and I love the I love the new factions. So I I, I mean, I think United Kingdom will play a huge factor this year. Uh, and I like the fact that you know you do see different people in these leadership roles. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Zach will have a great year, and I, I don't know, I don't know if we're if we're calling that stepping up, but I think he will, and I think uh, United Empire as well. Um, yeah, I go that route. Daryl says, I'm very impressed with United Empire. They actually come off like a band of brothers. The support they gave to Osprey in his match was incredible. Why is it that some groups have almost instant chemistry and some seem like Ghetto just put a bunch of names in a randomizer? And I suppose those are. Questions we're going to have coming forward uh, with the emergence of these new factions. But I will say already TMDK looks like a really smooth fit for the four of those guys and, you know, whoever else is going to be returning to Japan. Just four guys. I mean, of course, they're the guys that built the uh, Takataichi shows. So they've got built-in chemistry already. They've got history together. I'll just be interested to see what happens with this uh, Despi Suzuki narrator thing, if that turns into an actual faction. Um, yeah, and interested to see like which new guys get hoovered up to those new factions I've just mentioned. Yeah. It's uh, it's hard not to be impressed by them. And um, I, I think back to when I was able to talk to uh, Aaron Hanare. 
um, and him talking about going into and you know being approached by Will um, for United Empire. And you know, if if in fact they get a say to kind of be like, okay, you know, I I like this guy, I like this guy, and th- this guy could be, you know, that that helps with the chemistry. Um, and I'm sure there are some cases where it is, you know, names in a blender and we're just pulling names out of a hat. Um, but when you, when you have, I don't know, like, like just for, for me hearing Hanare say that does put a smile on my face in the sense that it's the leader, and I put that in quotes, has a vision of what this faction will be, probably along with um, members of uh, booking, but, you know, that they have that, that fingerprint and that, and they have a touch on those individual factions um, makes it incredibly exciting because I think they probably have thought about it for months, years of, okay, if I had this, what would I do? Would I do this? Would I do that? Um, so in their minds, they they kind of have this this vision of it, and seeing it, seeing it come to reality is pretty exciting. Philip, so I know I will caveat this question came in before the Yokohama show. Both Okada and Hiromu are great champions, but who do you see emerging this year as rivals for them? They both desperately need some fresh matchups. Is this the year Sonata finally gets a real push and maybe wins the New Japan Cup? So yeah, I don't necessarily think that's the direction we're going with Sonata but you know it could be if he does get this fresh coat of paint and moves faction and get sort of rebranded and new gimmick then you know maybe he will win New Japan Cup but it's not looking likely at the moment Okada I mean new life he's revitalized by this Kato Kiyomiya feud oh my god yeah so that's that's one ticked off the list already Hiromu I mean maybe someone emerges from the Dome show maybe it's Amakusa from Noah you know maybe it's someone from this junior show that steps up to challenge him. I mean, I suppose in recent years, his biggest rival has been Despi, but I feel like... When it's time for an adventure on the open highway, one quick call to American Family Insurance gets you headed in the right direction. Our travel peace of mind package is there if you encounter a bump in the road. From roadside assistance to rental car coverage, we have you covered. Find a local agent or get a quote at amfam.com. American Family Insurance. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, SI, and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. Download Upside and start getting cash back wherever you roll. It's like having your own hype man. Get an average of 17% cash back at restaurants. Oh, it's dinner time. Average of 13% on groceries. Get those groceries. 10 cents per gallon average cash back on gas. It's go time. Plus... Cash back at participating convenience stores, too. Stacks on stacks. Users can earn hundreds of dollars a year, three times more than other apps. Upside, show me that money. All right, we get it. Get it. It's easy. Just sign up for the free Upside app and start getting cash back for doing you. Download the free Upside app and use promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's promo code D-O-Y-O-U-1-0 for an extra $10 on the free Upside app. Get cash back for doing you with the free app from Upside. We've kind of done that. Yeah. I suppose the only thing that that rivalry is missing is a conclusive match in front of a cheering crowd. But I think we want to give a bit of time and space before we see that one again. But yeah, it's hard to pick who could be that big rival for Hiromu. I mean, if you if I had the book, it would be El Lindemann. I think he would be a tremendous mm. guy to build up and, and be someone to, you know, get, be, be that great rival for Hiromu. Because as we discussed earlier, I think, yeah, that's what he's missing. He's missing a, a rival right now. You know what name I, l- I would love? And Don't say really. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Uh, how about Leo Rush? Yes, I hadn't thought about him. That's that a great be, shout. I would love that. Um Again, you just don't know where we are, you know, in in his pro wrestling journey. But you know, if things were sorted out and we got we, I would like that. That that's one I would I would be super excited for. Anwar says, "How long will it be before Shota and Ren make it to a big slot at Wrestle Kingdom?" Uh, Cassie says, "Thoughts on the general timeline for Shota Umino getting the pin at Wrestle Kingdom 17 was a big statement. I'm curious when he's eventually going to start some bigger program." So, 
I think yeah, this what one do you think out. is the trajectory? I mean, I, I, Shota seems like the guy who's going to make a, a big match at Wrestle Kingdom before Ren does. I mean, Ren, as much as I love him and excited by him, he strikes me as a sort of mid card, upper mid card guy, whereas Shota Umino, you know, gun to your head, you would expect him to have the big Wrestle Kingdom match before Ren does, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, and it depends on what you think of big. Like, I think this coming Wrestle Kingdom, you know, in 2024, uh, I think we'll see them in at least significant mid-card matches. I really do. Both of them. Um, I don't know if they're going to be, you know, top of the card, but I think that I think they do. Um, this year is going to be a year where, where they build to that. Uh, I don't know about main events, to be honest with it. But yeah, he's tailor made. Like, yeah, he's, t- I mean, of all of them, I think, sh- I'm trying to think. Yeah, Umino's probably the guy. Yeah. Daryl says now that Vince is back, are we expecting Jonah in the New Japan Cup? I mean, he would be a, <laughs> a, a big name, actually, for New Japan Cup. I think that would be. You know exactly the sort of name that you want as someone that gets elevated and uh, a big match for Sakura Genesis, but no, he hasn't been fired yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to hold my breath for that, but uh, yeah, I'm sure he was sweating when he saw Vince was uh, putting himself back in charge. Unbelievable! Those poor people. They just didn't correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't I hear that he's like on like the C show now? Like he's doing uh, like oh, like main event? I guess it's called. Boy, oh boy. Oh, poor guy. <sighs> He's just trying to just trying to make a buck in this world. <laughs> yeah, hope the money's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we'll welcome you back with open arms. Yep. So, you know, you can always uh, oh, but anyway, if he comes back, then Zach's taking a spot as the leader of TMDK. So, you know, there's built an intrigue there. I'm kind of hoping he does come Here back. Here we go. Not on. hoping he gets fired, of course, but uh, no. you know what I mean. The door's always open. Uh, Let's put it that way. Yes. Uh, Ken says, in recent history, we've seen two adoption stories of veterans taking young lions under their wing. What are your thoughts about them, their successes and failures? Uh, do you think we should have more of them? Okay, so let me get this right. So we're talking Moxley and Shota mm-hmm. as one of them. Right. Now, the other one. Now, did this question come in before or after we had Fujisa joining TMDK? Can you think of any examples aside from those two that I've just mentioned that I'm overlooking? No. Uh-uh. Uh, maybe Ren and Shibata? Does that count? Um, yeah, that has to count. But I feel like that's an... Ex- no, it's... Yeah, I, yeah, I would put that in the same bucket. Sure. They're, they're good, basically, aren't they? I, I think it's sort of... You, you have to... It's a fine line between sort of lumbering them with the expectations that come associated with the rest of that's taken them under their wing. And I think that is a bit of a slippery slope for Narita. I think he's doing well navigating that. Yes. I think I'm really excited to see how this Fujita TMDK thing plays out. And it just seems like a a no brainer, really. Like, why would you not do that? It just seems like a really great way to have a young line and instantly give them a bit of chemistry with a new faction and a new wrestler and, a bit of an identity, but again, you just want to make sure they can be their own person whilst also, you know, in kayfabe, having some growth and, and imprint from the person who's taken them under their wing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is kind of pro wrestling one on one. You've you've had similar stories to, you know, veteran wrestlers taking a guy under or, uh, under their wing, and you know whether that leads to a heel turn or whether that leads to whatever. It 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 does lend itself to some credibility for the guys. Um, I mean, and, and, you know, at least you're not fucking master Watto and you got tens on up your, <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know, it's, uh, I feel like the, these guys have a better deal uh, out of this. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that is instant credibility and I, I wouldn't even say it's the easy way, but it's, it's, it's the way. So yeah, why not? Yaptai Strap says, thoughts on Wrestle Kingdom 17 being the most watched Wrestle Kingdom ever, trending number one worldwide on Twitter, despite the fact that, quote, no one talks about New Japan. <laughs> uh, and also the, the access numbers were very encouraging for the Osprey Omega match. Yeah. So 
Look. Yeah, I just think with uh, it's really timely that they've had the cheering crowds back because I think that's going to be a huge shot in the arm. And yeah, uh, I suppose they. I, I think they're doing all they can to keep the product exciting for the domestic, the Japanese fan base. But I think doing it for the casual US audience is trickier. And I think Osprey Omega is exactly the sort of thing that the right way to do that. But capturing that interest through the early months of the year is going to be more challenging. Yeah. And Look, yeah, I'm not sure. Like what, what is the next big thing that the casual Western New Japan fan can think, Oh, well this is coming up. I can't miss this. I mean, I'm sure it would be some type of joint promotion. Look, I'm going to say this and people may not agree and whatever, but even in the world of professional wrestling, as much as I hate to say it, New Japan is going to be one of those fringy things. Um, and when they have these big gates in these big houses, unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon how you look at it, um, it's going to be with the help of other promotions, especially here in the States. Um, that being said, it's yeah. look, Kenny Omega is a fucking draw and you can look at it any way you want to look at it, whether that's positive or negative. It just is what it is um, for a casual fan in the West. I would probably say the next thing that they would get super pumped up over is a forbidden door show. I mean, I don't think I I hope, but I don't truly believe that people that have watched that that Wrestle Kingdom event are going to be falling over themselves to watch New Beginning. I, I just don't see it. Um, but what it does do is it builds what and, and what New Japan has done so far, which is great, is it and just when it started before, you know, you know, five years ago, six years ago, whatever, it's it, it's it's a build, and it's people like us that help lead that charge in the sense that we're talking about it, we're 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 doing the heavy lifting, so to speak, um, and even Dave and e, you know everybody, like when when the when when the buzz gets around that this product is, you know, there's something that you need to watch, um. It'll pick up and and you'll grab on to other people and other people will be along for the ride. But to answer the question, um, honestly, either G1 or a joint show in the States. All right. That will do it for today. All thank right. you very much, Damon McDonald. That was uh, wonderful. Was. I, don't, I, I should thank you at the end of each show, shouldn't I? Thanks, oh, Damon. Well, thank you. Thanks for a lovely chat. Thank Always you. Always look forward to it. Uh, for taking time out of your busy day and uh, at night, uh, losing sleep for this. Uh, and thank you to Okada Shorts, the boys there. They, they did a great job, and that's coming up right after uh, Joel gives uh, our plugs. And uh, away we go. RedCircle.com forward slash shows forward slash super dash J dash cast. We always appreciate your donations. We give you all this content for free. So if you want to show some appreciation by giving us money, we would love that. Uh, Discord link you can get if you send me a direct message on Twitter at Cobra Kawaii and ProGressingTees.com forward slash SuperJCast for our lovely t-shirts. Big thanks to Editor Dan. Find him on Twitter at LousyHero219. Subscribe to the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network for other great shows. There's a tremendous episode of Music on the Mat with Andrew Rich and Rich Kreich talking about the themes for Monday Night Raw over mm. the years, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to. Give us a five snake review on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at the Super Jcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening and enjoy our chat with Okada Shorts about New Japan Tamashi. We have a special treat for you, Jcast listeners, today, as we are joined by the wonderful lads over from the Okada Shorts podcast, Rafe and Curtis. Rafe, Curtis, how are you? Uh, please introduce yourselves to the listeners. Who are you, and uh, why? Sh- why should we care? You shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Aggressive there. 
put you on the back foot. It's your fucking fault. So, oh, wait, am I already blowing out the swearing rule? I think I am. Uh, I what? You yes, got, you haven't done it enough. Yeah, are, we allowed, are we allowed to motherfuck on this podcast? You can do whatever you want. All right. Curtis, do the intro that we always forget to do on our own show. Well, we are the international uh, grand. Uh, sorry, hold oh, on. International wrestling. I f- oh, you fucked up already. God, God, damn it. Damn it. All right, like one minute from in. the countdown. Three, two, one. All right. Uh, no, <laughs> we are the inter- international wrestling grand pricks, the kings of shorts, the Okada Shorts podcast. I'm your good friend Curtis Spears. That is your bad friend Rafe Houston. Number yeah. one, Antonio super fans. What is up, Antonio? How you doing, buddy? We can't wait to hear your next question every week. <laughs> Are you getting Antonio questions? No, no, no. we're not getting Antonio questions. Wow. I'm just, a, I'm, I love hearing You're Antonio questions. We, is, can we do some sort of Antonio transfer? Is that, is that possible? I want, I anyway, want an Antonio I, podcast. I want Antonio to get out there and really let him, let his, uh, his voice be heard. You know, if I had a patron, that would, I would definitely do an Antonio question special, just like a full two hours of the very best of his questions. <laughs> do, you get, do you get like more than we even hear? on the show yeah no, but, <laughs> i don't want to bury the poor guy but most of the time they're unreadable for various reasons <laughs> well anyway we've derailed your show immediately so sorry about that <laughs> uh have you listened to this podcast before there, oh, there yeah, are no yeah. rails we don't, we don't do rails <laughs> yeah, when, do we, when do we talk about <laughs> boys <laughs> Only good time. I mean, nominally, you guys are here to help us uh, navigate the world of New Japan Tamashi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which I was actually planning to watch today. It was on my list of things to do. But unfortunately, I brought my MacBook to a cafe where we were having brunch with a friend and their one year old son spilt a glass of iced tea over my MacBook. So I turned it off immediately. So I didn't get a chance to watch anything. And I've just been leaving it out the whole day to dry. So it appears to be working, but you can never tell with these things. It could be long-term damage. First of all, do you think I should get them to pay for repairs? I mean, I've, I feel like it's kind of my fault for having the, the MacBook there in those dangerous circumstances, but it's also kind of their fault as well. So do you think do you think they should pay? Were, I think were you planning on watching? Yeah. yeah, what are you doing with a MacBook at brunch is what I want to know. Yeah, that's rude as fuck, well, man. I was, but I, I just don't like them. I don't, I don't like talking to people. No, I, absolutely I, fair. I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with it. What I want to know is, was there a lid on the cup that's supposed to stop it from spilling and that popped off? Because if it, is, uh, it does, I think you've got to... No, it was just a glass. Uh, then you it was just a glass of iced tea. Next, next time, I was on a separate table and the kid just sort of climbed over, lunged, bang, iced tea everywhere. Mm. I reckon the kid's paying for it. Allowance yep. for the next... 10 years or something. I say kill the kid. I don't know. <laughs> That's just me. I mean, I know. You don't agree. I spat my drink all over my keyboard. I was almost in a Joel situation within seconds. No, please. I am just kidding, of course. Do not condone the violence toward booger picking <laughs> children. You should have grabbed him up by the collar and Donkey Konged him on the head and be like, look here, you little booger eater. Yeah, <laughs> make him drink it. Make him s- drink this up. Drink this. Wow. So really really that. wow. Destinos with Esther, so that would have been a good chance to try it out. But uh, anyway, let's uh, try and get this thing vaguely back on track. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about how your podcast got off the ground and why we are completely to oh this is the, this is the part it. this is the part where we're supposed to suck you guys' dick isn't it yeah let's go get in the barrel let's away get, my man let's get going <laughs> I'll, I'll, down. Down. I'll get it started uh so it's called paying your dues it's called paying your dues <laughs> exactly you've got you've got a you've got to nod along when you can and when uh some friends introduce you to another friend you need to shout that out so i was a long-term uh and long-time fan of Super J cast and Pura cast, and I know Curtis was too. Uh, when you guys took time off for uh, little Arthur to get born, uh, you guys put out the call for guest hosts. And I had been doing my own podcast, interviewing professional wrestlers from around the world uh, for ages. And I just shot in a thing. And because you guys had asked for a little audition tape, and I was like, I don't need an audition tape, bro. Peep the interview with Robbie Eagles, bro. <laughs> and, uh, and then you guys were like, well, we're doing them in twos. There's this other schlub from America somewhere. Uh, maybe you guys could team up. And then I perused his Facebook, stalked him a little bit. He did the same with me. And then a best friendship was born, really. That's awesome. 
Look at that, Joel. Don't you feel good about yourself? Matchmaker. Finally, we did. Well, this- I, I don't. I mean, the, the, the unfortunate thing about this is now that you guys have a, a New Japan Pro Wrestling podcast, you are direct rivals to us. So That's true. I have to marry you. I mean, I, sorry, I don't make the rules, but... I mean, fortunately, Damon, I do listen to Okada Shorts every week, and it's it's absolute crap. I mean, they barely talk about New Japan. They mostly talk about WWE. Oh. When they do talk New Japan, it is just the most racist stuff you've ever heard. They do oh these God, horrible that. impersonations of the, the wrestlers. Really? Um, it's, it's sexist to the nth degree. When they were doing the historic crossover stuff, it was just some of the most vile, vile? content I've ever heard. Just oh. absolute unlistenable <laughs> But but I will say this: it, it is better than the WeWork Stiff podcast. So you got oh. that going for you. Oh, shots! Oh, oh no, God Almighty! We're not making any friends. On Josh's face. <laughs> this is this is the fucking mic bomb. Uh, my, what is it? Uh, pipe bomb. Pipe bomb. Pipe, pipe bomb of Joel. Yeah. yeah. What Speaking do you think of Lions Mark, Joel? What do you think of Lions Mark? <laughs> Oh, the podcast that happened like three times. Yeah, well, well done. <laughs> what about what about Kieran's new podcast, Ace Techers? Oh, so he interested. actually makes his own content. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you think about the, what do you think about the the? the uh, I, I don't even know anybody else. Who else? Who else? Uh, oh, uh, um, cr- uh, Chris Charlton left. We're, all the, Charlton, all the other Charlton did a new Japan right. podcast, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Did you listen to that eggshells? I think it was. Uh, well, that wasn't strictly New Japan. I mean, there was the official New Japan Pro Wrestling podcast, which my favourite moment of the you know eight episodes they had was Michael Craven <laughs> popping on right in the middle of one of the best best of Super Juniors in years, right. saying, "Oh, in the middle of best of Super Juniors, I haven't watched any of it, but uh, let's get this." <laughs> it's like Jesus Christ! I mean, you work for the company. Good. I know, I know. Listen. It's a hard. It's hard work. I, I, let me give you. Let me give you guys some advice. It's hard work. Uh, but you know what? Sometimes when you can change people's lives, <laughs> it, it's, it's it makes it all worthwhile. The power all worthwhile. of Perot. Yeah. yeah, you know, the it is amazing. That, the thing that I found and and why I like put it off for so long because I'd wanted to do a podcast for years. Like I said, I've been listening to Purecast and things like that for years, and I'd always thought I'd wanted to do one. Uh, but I thought, who the fuck would care what I have to say? And then right. a friend goes, why don't you play me what a wrestling podcast sounds like? And I played him something. And then he goes, and what's what you do sound like I play him something? He goes, it sounds exactly the fucking same. It's just losers talking about it. I just put it up. And I was like, fair enough. Two years later, yeah. I've been into my own podcast. And then uh, I actually find Okada Shorts to be way less stressful because of, like having like a partner and not like really organizing interviews and stuff. I just get to talk about new Japan and have a rant occasionally and stuff. And it's just super fun, you know? Yeah. You get it out of your system, right? It's like, I, who else am I going to talk? Like my other friends, they're, they're not into this. Um, so yeah, I kind of use it to purge my system, you yeah. know, to get, to get it out. Um, and I like talking to Joel and it's, I don't know. It's just a, it's, it's something that I look forward to. But, yeah, in the beginning, I was just like, who's going to listen to me fucking? Who cares, don't I, who cares what I think? Yeah. Um, but then you just do it for you. You know what I mean? You do it for you. And then all of a sudden, you find out people actually listen. And, you know, that's it's, the best that's, part, though. Like, your guys' friendship is. and, like, the fact that you don't give a fuck is wicked. Because at the end of the day, you're just like, we're going to have fun. And who gives a fuck? And then if people don't dig it, don't listen. Who cares? It's free. Fuck off. Yeah, that's it. Like no, no one's got time for the uh, the imposter syndrome, self deprecating bullshit. Yeah. No one cares. This this is good shit. This is good content. We are we are gods of the <laughs> wrestling <laughs> podcasting world, and my goodness, people are lucky to have us. So all right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right. I do feel like you're shooting on us every time I turn on an episode, no, and, and you're like, you're like, oh, the the number one New Japan podcast, the the real New oh, Japan podcast. I mean, we I hear that. It. I hear we it. are number one. I Listen, hear it, Joel. We we know. We, I've we never know. said that before in my life. I'm pretty yeah. sure that's a, a Purocast intro. I don't <laughs> even mention the words New Japan Pro Wrestling in our intro. That's true too. I do say that. I when, sometimes when when you throw it to me, I will uh, I'll stick in a number one just to just to remind everyone. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> go on, go on. So but I just don't lie. 
That's All the good. other podcasts died during the clap crowd era, so that's right. we're still standing. Yeah. Um, By default, we're the number one podcast. The to see it through. And that's where, see, that's actually a perfect example of where the friendship aspect of your show sees it through, right? Because in reality, if all you had was content and reading out reviews and things like that, it wouldn't have survived during that. But you no. guys are like, fuck it, we're going to read fan fiction about fucking wrestling and stuff. That, you was, know? Hard, yeah. that was hard you guys as fuck. an excuse to hang out. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think some of our better shows were that, you know. I still crack up at the Kenny Omega thing. The, uh, oh, my God. We just- Episode 97. That's, that's it in my memory. Just, yeah. We completely run out of stuff to talk about that incredible article. That's the holy grail yeah. of the episodes. <laughs> what? What? Uh, let me ask you guys a question. Let me ask you guys a question. That's what we're um, here for. Yeah. Um, talk to me about how you got into this product, uh, what drew you to it, and uh, what is the, the appeal to continue to do this? Oh, uh, I'll you take that. Uh, so I started watching uh, – my dad is the reddest of, of necks. He's like from from <laughs> – like South Georgia. And, uh, we were watching WCW from the moment I was born. Right. So Mm -hmm. back in the eighties, I'm seeing great Muda. I'm seeing Jushin Liger. Uh, and then like, as I became a teenager, I was seeing people like Tenzan and Masa Chono and, and stuff like that. And like, I would always kind of gravitate towards those guys more. It was uh, Jushin Liger was, I mean, just, just like you, Damon, like Jushin Liger is my fucking man, you know? And, uh, so, so, when I found out that I didn't have to just watch WCW, like those, those years of my life that I spent watching WCW, hoping to see those new Japan wrestlers, uh, later on as, as, you know, tape trading became more prevalent where I was, I could get to see, uh, you know, the, be- uh, Super J Cup uh, 94, that sort of thing. And I, I I was able to finally get into New Japan Pro Wrestling where I could watch those wrestlers that I loved so much. And it's it's really never gone away since then. I was, you know, knee high to a June bug uh, the first time I saw uh, Jushin Liger and I've I've never looked back. So you were around during the trait dating era. I, guess. I was I was. I think 15, 15 or 16 when I uh, traded my first tape. Yeah. Isn't it? Wasn't that just like, like if you think about it now, it's just like, what did, how did this this work? (laughs) Like, like how did you get the people and how did you, you know, I got into it in the weirdest fucking way. So my, the, the way I got into tape trading, my friend Jamal is huge into game shows. And this was before like game show network and things like that. He would, he would literally tape trade old episodes of like, uh, blockbusters or password wow. plus and shit like that with people. And he had, okay. I mean, just milk crates full of, of VHS tapes, eight hour, six hour VHS tapes, just full of like fucking old episodes of price is right. And he was, he was on a tape trading community. I don't remember what it was, but that's how, that's how he got me into it. He was, he was like, um, you know, talking about how you could tape trade anything. And I was like, well, let me go see if I can tape trade or, or look for, you know, people who are offering, episodes of uh you know new japan new japan pro wrestling and i was like oh yeah let's see what their weekly show is uh-huh. that's, that's not a thing but um right. you know i i was able to find uh people who were willing to to loan me like loan me to to send me some out of the goodness of their hearts because you have to like it was a one-for-one trading community mm. so like you'd have to find events that they didn't have that you had and you could you right. know swap back and forth i didn't have shit you know, so right. I was like, oh, OK, well, I guess I'm I'm fucked. And I started you know, getting to talk to these people and they, they were like, look, kid, we'll send you some some stuff that you can start off with. And, uh, you know, that's how I that's how I first started uh, tape trading. That's crazy. The game show thing blows my mind. You know, there's a community for everything, you know. Absolutely. I don't know why it blows my mind. I mean, we talk about a one particular Japanese pro, uh, pro wrestling promotion. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just amazing. All right. All right so how about you, Raf? Well, that stuff, like, to me, growing up in Australia, wrestling was, like, so far away, right? Like, I – was it – how did I first find it? I, I traded a, a magazine in school with, like – you know how we kids, you, like, trade toys or, or things? Like, I traded – Porno like, magazines. Yeah, yeah, porno magazines. <laughs> <laughs> I was after some buff dudes in a magazine, right? So, I traded a um, paint marker 
and on the front's Hulk Hogan or whatever, and I'm flipping through it, and there's like a full thing uh, spread of like uh, Ultimate Warrior and stuff, and I was like, what the fuck is this? You know, and and like and wrestling became like a thing that I was interested in, but I didn't know where to find it until like I went to like local video stores. Remember when people used to like rent VHS tapes and things like sure, that? Yeah. Never yeah. happened. Yeah. Never happened. <laughs> I know. Happen. It may be a lie, but I seem to remember it. And during that time, like we used to do things that things here, they'd do like five weekly movies for five bucks. And, you know, I'd go there on the weekend with my dad and stuff, and I would just rent like as many wrestling tapes as I was allowed to get. But it was a really like solitary fandom because nobody else knew what it, the fuck it was. No, it wasn't on TV. Nobody cared about it. Uh, I tried to get some friends into it. No one was interested. So it was just a thing that I sort of was into. I used to uh, watch pay-per-views with my dad. He got into it a bit with me, you know, Austin McMahon, all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then sort of in my university years, I got into a band and got right out of it uh, for a while. I always kind of kept on the periphery and played the video games and stuff, but I wasn't like really into it. And then it wasn't um, until, man, I was, I was in like my 30s, like, and I was living with my now wife and we were flicking through TV and, and Raw was on and, and we started getting back into it. And by then podcasts were a thing, right? So then I'm like listening to shoot interviews and I'm listening to different stuff and I hear about this match that's coming up. It's this guy named AJ Styles and he's versing this guy from New Japan, Wrestle Kingdom, Shinsuke Nakamura. It's going to be crazy. And I'm watching these videos, you know, and it's Shinsuke like splayed out on a couch talking absolute shit. I don't know what he's saying, but he looks like the coolest motherfucker of all time. And it's AJ Styles and it's Bullet Club and all this stuff. And then so I I don't know how to watch it. Luckily, pirating's the thing at the time. I managed to download it and I watch it and I was like, this is like everything I've wanted from wrestling. I was Fair. well and truly not interested like in the current WWE product. I was getting really sort of bored with all the repetitiveness of it and everything like that. And then when I saw that event, I, th- I think it was maybe Wrestle Kingdom 9, again, real bad with the numbers. But I was like, from start to finish, I was like, this is everything I've wanted from wrestling. And so then I started getting into it in any way I could. Uh, and it wasn't until I saw it in Japan for the first time that I got really invested. So we went on holiday to Japan and the first time we went, we weren't able to catch it. And I was gutted, but I was with like a group of people. And then the next time we went back, we went to a Road to New Beginning show. It was just after uh, Suzuki Gun came back and like attacked Okada. Mm, and yeah. we're like in the stands and they're coming through and we're like, this motherfucker's terrifying. This is awesome. Um, and then, yeah. And then I just started to digest everything I could. And then I've, been to every Wrestle Kingdom since then until the pandemic, you know what I mean? So uh, I'm actually looking forward to going back in April uh, for the first time since January 2020, uh, waiting to hear if I've got my tickets to Sakura Genesis, uh, and I can't fucking wait. Nice. That's fantastic. So what do you? why do you think you guys work well together? Like what, what is it about your partner that uh, works for your show? Well, uh, Rafe is the handsome one. And mm. uh, I'm the brains, right? Okay. So I, okay. Um, I don't know which of us is the wild card and which one is the muscles. Don't you think? Well, I mean, both. We're both wild cards and muscles. But I think it's probably safe to say that, like, we work pretty well together because, A, we're sort of the same person in a lot of ways. We have a lot of the same interests and stuff. Uh, but Curtis is more into, I guess, sort of details and stats and – and a little bit like that and being a bit more organized than me. And I'm a bit more about uh, vibing it and ridiculousness, I guess. And then we mm-hmm. just sort of have fun hanging out really, isn't it? I'm yeah. the Joel. <laughs> right. I mean, seriously. I mean, but here's the thing. It's like, you need that. You need to have, at least I do anyway, um, need to have that. Like I'm not doing any of the social stuff, but Joel's, you know, he's good and he's funny at it. And, you know, he's able to, you know, take that, Take the punches, I guess. <laughs> yeah. um, also, like, but, for me, having a well, talking about show, system, pure unadorated, hundred percent praise we get. Everyone loves our statement. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought don't, don't vanity it. search that. Don't. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I've learned that lesson many times. I'm pretty sure, it was number one podcast on the internet. Not even, not even like New Japan podcast. It was just number one podcast as well. Oh, just number one. Uh, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> the the, 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 the best podcast in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, um, so for me, I was just uh, yeah. saying that, like, because I have like another show where I like organize interviews and do all that stuff and organization stuff. I was kind of very clear as well. I'm like, this needs to be fun because I can't fucking do all of right. that always. So it's it's heaps of fun just to get on with him and and crank it up and do it. I still kind of get a bit crazy about editing when I probably shouldn't, but because mm. um, I, I get a bit. We do have editors. About- we yeah, do we, have, we literally have editors we can use and I'm just like, I'll do it my fucking self because I'm a right. psycho. But um, I, yeah, it's just super fun to sit back and relax and just talk some nerd really. Nice. All right. Well, speaking about fun, gentlemen, New Japan Tamashi, is that fun? What is it? <laughs> Why should we care about it? Give us the lowdown for people who are out of the loop, please. Okay. Well, I would say it is fun or at least it's definitely going to be. So, so this is where we're at so far in that uh, it started with a very humble first show. To be honest, I'm surprised they they televised it, not because it was bad, just because the level of production that they then brought on the on night two, because they were then using PWA stuff and all that, oh, was, night and was, night and, was night and day. And I think if anybody just tuned into that first show, that first humble show in New Zealand, and thought that's what it was going to be, there's a chance they may not tune back in because they would have thought it was really low. I, I, I think we actually had a uh, a person who talked about that on your uh, on your Twitter, Joel, because when you when you put up a question about it, there was someone who was like, oh, why did they even bother to put this on here? Like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it seemed like someone maybe just watched that first show and just didn't bother, yeah. uh, which is very I'll, I'll read the question. This is from uh, Zemo Finding. Please, please talk about Bonza not kicking out of the pin and then having to edit with a different result. So you, you have to clue us in about that one. Uh, also, Tamashi isn't worth watching. Every match was nine minutes and weren't even good young boy matches. I, I don't see the problem with every match being nine minutes. That seems a lot better. You know, that's, that's the strong style, right? Strong is... Uh, what 10 minute matches three 10 minute matches per per episode yeah yes yeah, three minutes or less there is definitely that. a place for that didn't that what we say said joel it's six minutes is the perfect amount for a match <laughs> that's about what my attention span is sure <laughs> like- oh he's gone uh, and oh, then yeah. the- <laughs> <laughs> I was just like i like i was sitting back and letting you guys take it and it was just dead come on <laughs> Yeah, I was sorry. Field it, but that, uh, I think he got caught up. But then, uh, but then the night two, um, then you get that PWA spectacle, and that, that's something they're really known for is that polish, and that that show brought it. I thought thought it absolutely was a real good show, and and really sort of highlighted what it can be. You know, they're gonna essentially try and build their own Australian strong. You know, Australian New Zealand strong, and yeah, it's it's very exciting to me. There's a lot of talented wrestlers here a lot of which were seen on the card uh and they're even bringing in more people with these new shows um and yeah i'm I'm personally really excited to see where it goes there's some real highlights coming up in the matches on uh nights three and four as for the bonza thing uh i wasn't live in the house so i didn't see that so i only i didn't see it live uh i was at work i had to put in the old awesome manga i didn't see it yeah yeah <laughs> Keep my head down on that one. But yeah, no, I I, uh, I didn't see it happen. So I guess it didn't happen in canon. Bonza's, <laughs> Bonza's a pro, man. Bonza would, you know, if, if he didn't kick out of something, maybe he was, you know, legit, you know, fucked up or something. I don't know. Bonza's a pro, though. I, I see a lot of talk about Jack Bonza. Who is he for the uninitiated? Uh, so Jack Bonza is one of like the the main kind of people at PWA, like one of the main trainers and everything like that. And he has always had like a real military aesthetic. Uh, and I recently did an interview with him on our show. And when you when you hear that interview and when you hear how he talks, he kind of lives that, you know what I mean? And the way he approaches everything, he's not really from the military, but he, he definitely has that sort of trainer sort of drill sergeant mentality in everything he does. And so, and the way he kind of explained it to me is that they were looking to obviously expand Bullet Club. This probably would have even happened sooner. Obviously the pandemic and everything happened and he fit the role. And I mean, when you look at him and Farley together, it makes sense, right? Mm. 
It really does. He's he's one of those. Uh, he's a very harsh looking dude. He's got a big bushy red beard. He's bald headed, like intimidating motherfucker. Like if you're if he's at the bar and you spill his drink, you apologize and you say you're sorry. Mm-hmm. And uh, then he probably still would uh, hit you with a chair. <laughs> See, now, now, now you learned your lesson, Joel. Now you know what to do. <laughs> Future. Yeah, and so the finish of that match was absolutely perfect. I don't know what everyone's talking about. Uh, <laughs> from those uh, those two shows that have made it to New Japan World, are there any matches on there that you think are worth going out of your way to see? Not just for the stars, but you know, just just get a feel for. You know, the stars of the future, you know, uh, who are going to be the names to watch or just anything that stood out from those first two shows. Absolutely. Um, do you, do you have any notes, Chris, or would you like me to field a couple of these for you? Um, I, I, uh, so let me pull up, I'm going to pull up the card while you, uh, you vamp. <laughs> I'll vamp a little bit. So I would say, um, the opening match, uh, of night two was Matt Diamond versus Jordan Allen Wright. Now, I wasn't familiar with Jordan Allen Wright, but I do know who Matt Diamond is. He's Robbie Eagle's tag team partner. He's the other half of the Lightspeed Express, and that w- they were originally supposed to be the main event, and it was going to be a tag match. Robbie had opted to be in a tag match rather than a singles match to showcase Matt Diamond and to to do that, yeah. Uh, I don't remember who it was. Oh, Jeff Cobb couldn't come. And I think maybe somebody else. But anyway, they had to reshuffle the card last minute. Uh, and Robbie ended up in a singles match. And so Matt Diamond had this singles match. But I feel like it was a great snapshot at like an absolute pro thrown in for the first time, short notice, absolutely killing it. I thought Matt Diamond was really good. Yeah, I I, uh, I would throw out watching Richard Mulu versus uh, Michael Richards. Uh, if you watched the Lions Roar program, like those are two of the people that really stuck out. Like uh, Michael Richards, like was kind of like the heart and soul of that, that entire yes. uh, show. Yeah. Big fan of him. And Richard Mulu was one of those guys who like you, you see in the show and you're like, Oh man, this guy, like he's, he's making it, you know, he's uh, he's a big, you know, uh big dude. And he's not really like, able to do as much in the ring physically or, or like do the, as much of the training and stuff like that, but he never gives up. So you really see a lot of his, uh, his heart and determination. So when you, when you see those two in a match together and it was, uh, Mulu had to, uh, step in cause it was going to be Jeff Cobb versus Michael Richards. And I, I remember texting Mike and being like, dude, that's an amazing moment for you. But when Jeff couldn't make it, he gave Richard Mulu his first New Japan wrestling match, which is really, really fucking cool of him. He did talk about that uh, when we interviewed him on our show, Okada Shorts. Uh, check it out, Okada Shorts podcast. And um, <laughs> there you go. that's a professional right there. I like that. And Okada Shorts for you. on all social media platforms. Yeah. <laughs> Link tree. No. Uh, so he he was able to give Richard his first uh, match, which was really cool. So you can really see how far those guys have come uh, since the the Lions Roar program was recorded. Yeah, and R- Richard uh, Richard Mulu was like that lovable character it, on the documentary. You Absolutely. Know, like, at the end, I think I think that even said like he didn't get called up and he he had to go home because he had some family issues, but he intended to come back and start training again. That was like one of the last things in the documentary. So it was really cool to see him back and then to see him. That was on night one. Dude's all heart, all heart. Richard Mulu, so awesome. Um, was that night one or night two? That was night one. Yes. Cause that was the one that was Ken- that Kenta was on. Kenta was on, uh, uh, against Andrew Villa Lobos, who was another, uh, trainee from the, uh, New Zealand dojo. That was a good match. Uh, that one went 15 minutes. So, you know, whoever that guy, you know, Might said that it was a nine minute match. Sport. There you go. <laughs> what would, what would you guys want to see out of, out of this Australian branch? Like, like, how do you, like, do you think it's more of a, of a strong or would you like it to be like a developmental area? Like what, or, or just its own entity? Like, what would you want out of this to kind of satisfy your pro wrestling itch in yeah. Australia? And what's, what, would, what would the ceiling be for it as well? Just to yeah, piggyback yeah. off that. Well, as like somebody that lives here, I'd love to see like a legitimate touring brand, you know, that like comes through i've been fortunate enough to see new japan in perth where i live a couple of times when they're on tour you know before everything got locked down they were starting to actually pick up steam and it would be great to see them you know multiple times a year come through and then also to see the stars of new japan appear like 
Zach with TMDK and, you know, obviously Robbie's going to be a very big part of this going forward and Hanare has got like a headlining match coming up. You know, give those guys – or Aussie Open, you know, there's, there's some really big like Australian stars and stuff that are a part of the New Japan roster. It would be really awesome to see them on the move regularly. And I, I think, yeah, its own – kind of self-contained thing, you know, with titles. Like, yeah, I guess a strong is a pretty good thing, but, I mean, what what's the ceiling on anything? Like, it would be really nice to see something that, that is built and stands on its own and then, you know, you have a G1 or whatever and the and the Tamashi champion is in it. You know, that would mm. be – that would be cool, man. Yeah, I think for me – That was the, a question from uh, – Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry go go ahead. Ahead. I think for me, the uh, the thing is just seeing new wrestlers. Like, we've seen uh, a lot of these dudes from Strong on AEW. Uh, we've seen them on Impact and things like that, and that's cool. I've never seen Caveman Ugg before. You know, like, that's that's awesome. Let's see some people who, you know, are brand new. You know, that's what I want to see. Yeah. And we're going to on these next uh, two nights. Night three and night four have got some cool matches coming up. Yeah, talk to us about those then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, some of the highlights of things that I'm looking forward to, like on nights three and four, um, you can see the Velocities will be in action. So Paris De Silva and Jude London, they were on the other shows, but anytime you can see them, awesome. They're, they're currently dual champs. I think they're PWA and then was it ASC, I forget, like a New Zealand one. But they were recently the UK OTT champions and only just finished up being that. They're world class and any platform they can get, they would they would have been perfect in like the super junior tag. That would have been really cool. Um, Rogami versus United Empire. Mark Davis isn't on these, so I don't know whether he's injured again or doing something else, but it's gonna be Fletcher and and Hanare. And mm. I'm interested in seeing those two as a team. I think that dynamic could be really cool. Um Richards, okay. Michael Richards versus Ricky South. Ricky South is the PWA champion. Uh, from all reports, the hardest working man in the room anywhere he goes. And I think his ceiling is really high uh, with New Japan. And then um, on the, the – oh, sorry, you go, Chris. One of the, one of the uh, matches I'm really looking forward to is – and this is going to wet your whistle here, boys. Robbie Eagles versus Kyle Fletcher in a, in a Ooh, singles yeah. match, right? Yeah, how hard are you for that one? That's not bad. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm erect. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's night four, Damon. You need to be ready for that one. Also, uh, Hanare versus Caveman Ugg is going to be awesome. Now, if you haven't seen Caveman Ugg before, he's an actual caveman, uh, <laughs> but, but a very big part of MCW and PWA, and an amazing wrestler, like a big hoss wrestler, um, uh, uh, but surprisingly agile as well. Also, we get to see uh, Slex. Slex is on this. He's a member of TMDK, right? Right, Rafe? Yes, he is. Yep. Nice. He was so more TMDK to representation. Honor. Yes, exactly. And he was signed to Ring of Honor just before the world ended. Like they were mm. airing, you know, promo videos and stuff. Slex is coming, all that, and it didn't get to happen. So it's going to be really cool to see him get a platform. And probably one of the last ones, I mean, there's lots of stuff here, but um, – on the opening night of night four, opening match, we'll get to see a couple of the young lions versus Gore and the final boss, Jake Andrew Arthur. So I know both of them from Deathmatch Down Under, a promotion very close to my heart that I do uh, a lot of coverage with. Gore is an absolute human weapon. And by that, mm -hmm. I mean he's trained in every martial art in the world and maybe the most dangerous person I've ever met. Uh, and Jake Andrew Arthur. Does he know Krav Maga? He, he knows them all. Like he risk control, <laughs> risk control. <laughs> he knows Krav Maga, then everyone else is in trouble. Yeah, yeah. They, they're all in trouble because he he like literally like was pro MMA and then he like lived in Thailand, probably around the corner from you, training in like kickboxing and stuff. And now he literally trains people in martial arts. Absolute weapon and final boss, uh, which is such a great marker. <laughs> Jake Andrew Arthur is like. A judo champion or something like Olympic judo champion. I forget what it is, but like both two legit shooters who are going to destroy anybody they come across. I couldn't believe when I saw the snuff daddy gore on a New Japan show. Oh, wow. Give me a guy, and each of you, give me a guy who, if you were to pick one person, blue chipper, 
this guy needs to be on the main roster full time. Who you picking? Uh, well, I mean, I got to go with my homeboy. Like I've, I've, I don't want to say friends. I don't want to brag. No, um, Michael Richards is, uh, you know, he really won my heart. And, uh, you know, we, we've talked with him about how he didn't make the best first impression in, uh, to the new Japan faithful, uh, when he showed up for that young lions cup. And, uh, you know, he, he took that upon himself and he said like, yeah, um, it was not a good look for me. I felt really bad about it, you know? And then he, he said, I, I didn't quit. I, you know, nose of the grindstone and I've made myself better. And I really think that like, if you want, someone who's going to be just like a badass, like brawling white meat baby face. Like he could be the dude. And, um, you know, he's got a, a power move set. He's got uh, a good look. He's, you know, he's trained himself. He's, he's bulked up. He's got, you know, a ton more muscle. Now he's in way better shape than he ever was any other time we've ever seen him. And, um, I, I think that good things are on the horizon for him, man. There's, there's nobody that has a work ethic like Michael Richards. And I think that's going to show through. I, I think that this Tamashi experiment could be the Michael Richards show someday. Hmm. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great call. Um, since you have chosen Michael, I'll go ahead and say I'm trying to think who the Japanese crowd would, could love. Caveman, you know, come on, caveman. Oh, no. <laughs> I just like saying the name. Comes in with like skulls on his shoulders, like saber tooth tiger shoulder pads, and a giant fur cape, and so, they'll love him. They'll absolutely love him in Japan, uh, and and he's a weapon. Mm-hmm. Do you do you know much about Liarbird Lucci? I do. Because uh, uh, he just joined he, Bullet he Club last one. night, didn't he? Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He he just joined Bullet Club last night or the night before. You know, time zones. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. Tell tell us about him. Uh, so he's he's kind of a. That's actually super interesting for me to hear. So I had missed that because he's kind of like a wild card. He's almost like a. A gypsy character who's always up to something, you know what I mean? Like when I was speaking to um, our boy Bonza, he was telling me like he's the kind of guy who comes to the ring in a wheelchair and says he can't wrestle and then he's rolling people up and stuff. You know what I mean? He's always up to something. He, he's a, a definite like bard and a and a larrikin and a, a naughty scumbag. And so – I guess I guess he definitely fits, but I, I hadn't heard that. That's a interesting draft for them because it's not like that kind of military rogue army vibe. That's something else completely different. Mm. Well, it is official. I've I've seen it on the, on the I think PWA Twitter. Uh, it's yeah. it's there. Wow. Okay, then. Well, there Breaking you go. Breaking news uh, here on the Super that. J cast. Um, no. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> there you go. Breaking news. Uh, hey, also, you- while, while we're discussing it, I'm in Bullet Club as well. <laughs> just right, right. Right. <laughs> Joel joined last night. Oh, Joel uh, joined. Over- yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll retweet it and send it to you guys. How about that? Perfect. Oh, there you go. Everybody there you can go. see. Spoiler okay, alert. Let me ask you a question from just, uh, 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 Multiverse Ace, who says, uh, who are the oceanic wrestlers that we should keep our eyes on and who is considered the territory ace? Also, how popular is professional wrestling in Australia and New Zealand? So I don't know if there's a bit of crossover there with guys you previously talked about, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, your thoughts on either of those questions, please. Um, I mean, the ace is Robbie Eagles in my eyes. Like he, he's the, you know, the flag bearer, the standard bearer for – Australian wrestling in a lot of ways, you know, uh, that and the, the TMDK guys, I mean, they're from Perth as well. So they're, you know, a big part of it. Uh, then you look at Jonah and stuff, but I would say in new Japan and in that, you know, atmosphere, Robbie Eggers is definitely the ace for sure. And then is it big in Australia and New Zealand? Absolutely not. Um, but it, it is growing and the independent scene is growing uh, and it's becoming more and more sort of um, – I don't know whether it's just being part of the scene and meeting more people, but it seems to be becoming more and more mainstream. The more people I talk about and stuff, it's kind of normalised and more of my friends are wanting to go and see stuff and things like that. So I feel like it is gaining in popularity. I sort of thought what you were, you were talking about, Caveman Ugg there, what are the odds we can get – him over for Fantastic Mania and have Caveman Ugg versus Barbaro Cavanario. You read my mind. Uh, the Caveman. 
That would be amazing. <laughs> they should absolutely do that. <laughs> Read my mind. Um, what do? You, why do you think it's? Or let me, let me phrase it this way: um, What do you think is the biggest challenge that they have moving forward to grow the product? Distance. Yeah. Like Australia is so far apart. You know what I mean? Like there's only like, three cities me, in the entire continent. <laughs> yeah, it's like for me to for me to get there from Perth, it's like a five hour flight. You know what I mean? Wow. Depending on which way I'm going and stuff, and it's not cheap. You know, they're running this big festival in Wagga Wagga coming up, which is super interesting and kind of fucking insane. But they're they're doing it, and I'm like, I would love to go to that, but it'd be so expensive, like to do it. And, and then even if you're just based in Melbourne, it's like it's not super close to Sydney or super close to. Brisbane or South Australia, it, it is distance, you know, and that, that's why when I was talking about I would love to see them tour and stuff like that, it's making themselves available. But that's not cheap to do. A lot of a lot of touring bands and stuff don't come to Western Australia because it is that distance and that expensive. Uh, by the mm. time they do it, they're like, we can do these other cities that are a bit close to each other and then, you know, leave. Right. Also, right. the fact that Australia doesn't actually exist. It's a NASA ploy. Um, sorry, <laughs> this is a podcast. I, know, I thought <laughs> I, I'm very familiar with Australia. Also, Thank all you the very dangerous much. animals. Everybody always talks about that too. They've got mm-hmm. dodge sharks. Nice. Ate the baby. We, yeah, Dingo ate the baby. Yeah, and and you got those fucking spiders, the size of uh, small cats. Mm. <laughs> it's not the big ones you need to worry about, though. You just flick them away. It's the smaller ones with colors. No, no, you, you don't just flick them away. You fucking run and burn the house down. Yeah. Yeah, nah, it's fine. As long as you know where he is, it's not a big deal. If I can see his legs and I know where he is, then we're on the same page. It's fine. He can live there. That is the most disturbing shit I have ever heard you say, and I've heard you say that's a lot called, of disturbing shit. That's just called being Australian. You, uh, if I spent my time killing all the dangerous stuff, I wouldn't do anything else. I'd just be an exterminator. <laughs> Perfect. It'd be a full-time job. Perfect. Uh, let's, um, I'm going to throw some names at you. Sure. Uh, and you tell me who's better, uh, NXS or Crowded House? <laughs> NXS. Right. Mm, I would say Crowded House. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> One of my favorites, both of them. Bauhaus and New uh, Order. Well, I've got a, a question for you. If you are from Will C on our Discord, he says, if you, uh, remember, Will. can you please ask how you feel about the travesty that is the greatest tag team in Australia. Back pain being left off the Tamashi cast. Now, is there an actual tag team called Back Pain in Australia? I think me I and Rafe being forty-year-old men are the uh, are, are the, the tag team that is Back Pain. pain. <laughs> I, I, I've never heard of Back Pain. Maybe I should Google them right now and we'll see what they are. Now, let's have a look. This is great, Randy. <laughs> uh, well, let, let me jump on one more question then. So, uh, g- please give me your hot take predictions for Tamashi in twenty twenty three. You want to go first, Kev? Oh, uh, hot first take kid. prediction. I'm going to vamp until I can think of something. No, hot take prediction for uh, Tamashi. Um, you're you're going to see it be more successful than Strong. Uh, I think Strong had a lot of people on there that were uh, overexposed. And I think Tamashi is going to be, uh, it's going to be a better crowd. It's going to be a better production and it's going to have uh great quality i won't say it's better quality because strong was a very quality uh program as far as the wrestling goes i think it's just going to be a better overall product than what you saw with strong i don't disagree i like that i think the the self-containedness of it could lead to something pretty special pwa already put out like a really great product and this whole thing is is leaning really heavy on what they've already built. And so I think they're just going to sweep that up into what Tamashi is, use the New J- Japan guys as well, and and kind of create something pretty cool. Also, All I right, well, thank you. Container. I'm looking at them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I think they just made it up, I'm sure. It's, no, 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 it's a real thing. Back, it's a real thing, but I, I, I'm unfamiliar with them. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Because our Discord are very good at making stuff up. So, so, <laughs> some circles of Twitter will now uh, thinking that Tetsuya Naito is a free agent. He's not a free agent. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Rafe and Curtis, for taking the time to talk to us today. Get your plugs in. 
Okay. Uh, well, uh, if you enjoy our particular brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes for free, uh, you can go ahead and find us on the Faces and Feels podcast where Rafe does an interview with uh, various independent pro wrestlers. And you can find me on the Throw and Dice podcast where I talk about um, tabletop wargaming, tabletop role playing, and all of the beautiful hobbies that are, uh, you know, contained within uh we also have uh the lovely count out podcasting network those are the people that contacted us after they heard us on the super jcast they came to us and they said hey guys we're looking to start a new japan pro wrestling podcast we like your uh we like your chutzpah and we would like for you to uh come and do that for us so the count out podcasting network where you can find all sorts of shows uh, with you know dealing with various uh, wrestling companies wrestling products and wrestling styles uh, they have a patreon uh, where you can go to patreon.com slash count out pod and that's uh, that's you know where a way you can support us uh, other than just liking and subscribing and things like that uh, listening we all of that though is just to say please listen to our show please <laughs> at Okada shorts, which you can find us everywhere on the social medias. Uh, when count out came to us and we're like, we heard you on the super J cast. We want a new Japan show. I said, will you edit it? And they said, yes. And then the deal was done. <laughs> that is that. <laughs> they've never, they've never actually edited it for uh, maybe one, maybe one episode. I did it, I did it once. And uh, my, it didn't tick all my OCD boxes. And now I just do it myself. Rafe so won't I even let me edit the show. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you're welcome to edit this one if you like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure Dan would love a break. Jeez. When, when oh. I when I did the uh, the guest host thing, I completely edited it before I even sent it to Dan, and he's oh like, "Sorry, God. bro, I've got to cut so much of this out." And I was like, "God damn you, Dan!" Dan's actually we have a limit. Thing. Yeah, we have a limit of like size file or and time and yeah, and I yeah, did with yeah, like three hours. Of- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's good. I, mean, love I love the fact that. You guys found the connection through this product, New Japan, and again through Super Jcast, which is, you know, that warms my heart. I love it. I love the fact that you're doing it. I love the fact that you love doing it. Uh, you guys sound great. Um, I'm I'm thrilled that we were able to, uh, I don't know, connect you guys. I feel, I feel good. I feel warm and fuzzy I, over I, you guys. I, I, you know I, what? what? This, this dude's become one of my best friends, man. Like, we, we talk nearly every single day about lots of stuff and we both had pretty hard years in the last year and he was always somebody I could lean on, you know, and that's oh. because of what you guys gave us. Yeah. And I like you just what you, you guys do or, or bullshit aside and all, all the jokings and stuff. I've been listening to your shows for a long time, Puro cast into super J cast and it's never let me down. It's been what, like probably my most consistent listen to podcast and all <laughs> bullshit and all stuff aside. I really appreciate what you guys do. It's actually fucking awesome to meet you finally, Damon. And I just want to say thank you for putting out so much content. I know it's not easy. I've done it for a long time. It takes up time. It's hard to fucking get it sorted. Sometimes you don't want to do it. And it means a lot that you keep doing it, you know? So thank you, man. I appreciate that. I know Joe does too. Um, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's funny. The uh, Rafe's not the only person I've actually met through the Super J cast. Like, um, I, I, we all know uh, Sipsy. I, I've uh, I'm actually going to be going out with Sipsy before the uh, Michael Oku Zack Saber Junior match. We're going to be doing a double date. His his wife and my wife, and we're we're all going to oh, be going wow. to that show together. Editor Dan, I met him at Royal Quest. Absolutely fantastic human being. Um, yep. Booze Leprechaun. Uh, she and I are, are are friends now. We were actually thinking about starting a podcast together before we uh, before Rafe and I got approached by Count Out Podcast. So, uh, you know, like there's there's a community out there, and it's all because of you two and your propensity for fucking fart jokes. <laughs> we do love a fart joke, but I'm not gonna lie, we we, we are big fans of fart jokes, guys. It has been a pleasure. Uh, thank you. Thanks for taking the time. I mean, you're on opposite sides of the world, and you know, making time for us to do this. I know uh, a lot of our listeners are excited to hear your thoughts on um, the scene in Australia. And uh, I, again, I really appreciate you guys taking the time for us. Yeah, no Thank problem. You. I'm sure they don't give a fuck, but we had fun, so it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> any, Joel, any, uh, you know, Damon, anytime you want to talk uh, NHL hockey, fucking get yes. at me, bro. All get right, let's me. do it. I'm an Avs fan, so we can uh, you can ask what it's like to see your team win a championship. Oh! <laughs>
Oh, you motherfucker. motherfucker. <laughs> oh. Joe, wrap this shit up. <laughs> guy's, taking, guys taking jabs. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you again very soon. Take it easy. Absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. Peace Love out. Love you. Download Upside and start getting cash back wherever you roll. It's like having your own hype man. Get an average of 17% cash back at restaurants. Oh, it's dinner time. Average of 13% on groceries. Get those groceries. 10 cents per gallon average cash back on gas. It's go time. Plus, cash back at participating convenience stores too. Stacks on stacks. Users can earn hundreds of dollars a year, three times more than other apps. Upside, show me that money. All right, we get it. Get it. It's easy. Just sign up for the free Upside app and start getting cash back for doing you. Download the free Upside app and use promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's promo code DOYOU10 for an extra $10 on the free Upside app. Get cash back for doing you with the free app from Upside.